I go for refuge until I'm enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly. By merit that I create from giving and other perfections, may I attain the state of the Buddha in order to benefit all sentient beings. I go for refuge in time and light to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme. By merit that I create from giving and other perfections, may I attain the state of a Buddha in order to benefit all sentient beings. I go for refuge and tell I'm enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly. By merit that I create from giving and other perfections, may I attain the state of a Buddha in order to benefit all sentient beings. Okay. So, um, so far we've done two Chen Rezig practices, and this afternoon we're going to be doing a slightly more elaborate one, um, which is got the eight verses of thought transformation embedded in it. So, has anybody had the eight verses of thought transformation by Geshe Longritampa teaching at some point in their Dharma life? Eight verses? Totally new to everybody. New? Not, not to you. <laughs> Um, the eight verses are full on. Okay. So they need some context because the first time you read them, you'll be like, oh, that's a terrible idea. I don't want to say that. Boy. Um, so they need context. All right. But I think a little bit of what we need to talk about is sutra versus tantra or sutra in tandem with tantra and how the two work together. So sutra is like thought transformation working with, you know, the everyday difficulties of life and kind of applying some kind of radical reframing, like you would in, you know, I don't know, cognitive behavioral therapy, you know, you think, okay, this is a difficult situation. How can I use it as a lesson to transform my life to be of benefit to others? You know, I didn't want to lose my job. How can I see it as an opportunity? You know, like really straightforward stuff that's not even specific to Buddhism per se. Right? There's a lot of systems in the world that would say, here's how to make the most of it. Yeah, Buddhism does this in a slightly more, well, slightly, in a radically more in-depth way, but it's versions of a theme. Yeah. So when we do the eight verses of thought transformation, this is from the sutra perspective, and it's really looking at life through the lens of transformation. Now, tantra is like thought transformation, but for the subtle mind. Sutra is thought transformation for the coarse mind. And framing it in this way kind of helps us understand how the two can be used in tandem. And you actually can't practice Buddhist Tantra without Buddhist Sutra. Yeah. And so when you're practicing Buddhist Tantra, you need those fundamentals of first just looking at samsara, cyclic existence, this uncontrolled reincarnation, and thinking my negative emotions, my bad moods, my unfortunate behaviors are problematic. Like, just say it to yourself, right? Not just like they're inevitable or they're me or they're part of life, but you think, no, they're problematic. Yeah, some of my moods are really unfortunate. I would like to have more control over them. Some of the things I say are not skillful. I would like to change those. And sometimes I'm not as happy as I wish I was. How come can that change? You know, you, you need a little bit of actually the suffering I experience and the suffering I give are not inevitable. And I actually want to change the pattern. So renunciation is the determination to free yourself from those negative patterns. You genuinely want to. You're genuinely disillusioned with the way life has suffering. But you're not disillusioned in a depressed way or in a heavy way. You're disillusioned with hope for transformation because you know the mind is trainable. It'll just take some work, right? So sutra, all forms of Buddhism have renunciation. Yeah, so you're not giving up anything except suffering. That's what you're renouncing. You're renouncing suffering. So it's not the objects that you're giving up or the pleasure that you're giving up. It's about changing your relationship to things, to people, to situations, so that nothing owns you. Does it make sense? So you need renunciation. And then from our Mahayana perspective, you also need bodhicitta. So that's that mind of enlightenment that wants your own transformation to be directly beneficial to others. 
and that your whole reason for working on your mind is to be a benefit to others in this ripple effect way. Yeah. And then you combine with that wisdom and specifically the wisdom realizing emptiness, which is how you cut the root of samsara. So it's the emptiness of inherent existence. We're not talking about nihilism. We're not talking about nothingness. Okay, so those three principal aspects of the path are never left behind when you practice Tantra. They're even more firmly ingrained. So then when you move on to practice Tantra, what you're saying is on the basis of those kind of, you know, intellectually reasonable premises, I'm starting to play with energy. And I'm starting to look at transformation from a different perspective. And I'm starting to use the subtle mind, even though I don't yet have access to the subtle mind. So far, our only relationship to the subtle mind has been basically a death, right? Every time we die, we get a little glimpse and we're like, oh, peace. Oh, whoops, back to it. Yeah. <laughs> and we get tiny little snapshots at other portions in our life. You know, when you have a big yawn or a big sneeze, you have like a fraction of a second of kind of that manifesting. There's some other times in an adult relationship where it might arise as well, but it's not particularly in your control. Yeah. So the subtle mind, while not yet under our control, is still something we can start to come closer to and build a relationship with. And that's where we're building Tantra in. So never leave behind the good practical sutra things when you start to practice Tantra. Are you with me so far? Do you have questions about the practices that we've done so far before we go into the more advanced one? Bits or, you know, just as you're looking at any of the prayers or sections, did you get stuck or hung up on any sections? Yeah, Rio, go ahead. That's kind of why. Why? I mean, that was good at first, unless you have the initiation of. Yada, yada. Don't imagine yourself as. Yes. What what would that be for? What would happen? Yeah, what would happen if you're like, ha you're not the boss of me, I'll do what I like. <laughs> um, Maria's asking about um, doing the practice with the initiation as opposed to without the initiation, or seeing yourself as the deity or not yet seeing yourself as the deity. And what would happen? <laughs> yeah. Um, and, you know, these practices are laid out for people who have empowerments, who are already full-fledged Buddhists all the way in, hardcore, and have then gone on to take an empowerment or an initiation specific to that deity. And yet, this particular retreat and this particular book is meant for people who don't necessarily have empowerments yet, might not even be totally Buddhist yet, but at least have a strong respect for Buddhism, right? Um, and so what would be what would happen is if you start practicing these in their full-fledged way without the empowerment is that you don't have the connection of the lineage of blessings, which means the oomph and the power is not going to be the same. The practice is not going to be as effective. And you might start to doubt the, the practice or doubt yourself because it's not working or it's not working a lot. It's working a little. So one reason is just it's going to be less efficient and less connected, um, you know, when you're in this kind of beginning stage before you've linked up with the unbroken oral tradition from the time of the Buddha. Okay. Um, No one's going to come and like slap your wrist and be like, how dare you? But it's also, it's a question of, have you made a direct relationship with the practice in this formalized way, which also protects you? Because sometimes when you're practicing Tantra, interesting and sometimes problematic energetic experiences start to happen. And if you've got no one to hold you and no community to hold you and no connection to the lineage to hold you, in very rare cases, it can trigger some psychosis. Yeah, it's um, kind of messing with things that you that are interesting and don't seem problematic, but then what if it takes a turn? Then who's gonna kind of catch you when you fall? Yeah. So that's one reason not to practice in the full-fledged way until you have the empowerment. Another is just respect for the tradition of that. Yeah, and to kind of um, wait for permission. Yeah, permission. So most of you are used to probably the fact that Buddhism is an open religion, 
right? It's an open practice. It's not like, you know, religions related to some indigenous cultures or different religions throughout the world that might say only the practitioners of this path can do these practices. Buddhism's not like that. You don't have to be Buddhist to practice Buddhist stuff, right? This is probably something you already know. The, ex the exception is Tantra. To do full-fledged Tantra, you do actually have to be Buddhist. And that is for your own grounding and your own support. Um, that's for your own nourishment, but also so that it actually works, <laughs> right? Um, so for it to actually work, you kind of need to be all in. But in this experimental stage, like we're doing in this retreat, don't feel pressure to be all in. Yeah, it's more just kind of tiptoeing into some ideas and seeing if there's some resonance. And if so, you can go ahead and take the next step and do it in the full-fledged way. So um, I am not clairvoyant. I don't know what you're doing in your mind. You do what you like. It's your business. Um, it's none of my business what you're up to in your own mind. But I guess just kind of approach it from the perspective of, let's see what happens if I do it as written, because why reinvent the wheel? I don't know. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Yeah. And it's a good question. And if you accidentally, right, <laughs> arise as the deity before you have permission to arise as the deity, just be like, oh, whoops. Anyway, back to the crown. You know, don't like put pressure on yourself and overthink it or get, you know, kind of um, superstitious or anything. Just be like, oh, whoops, back to the crown. Yeah. yeah other questions about the practices so far? Or tantra. It, yeah, go it ahead. It seemed like when you were doing that other meditation, you started out as saying that Chen Rezik appears, Chen Rezik, and then you started saying I, my. So I thought I felt like it was kind of then we were supposed to kind of internalize it. No, it's just the way the text is written. And you know, when when possible, I try to gently adjust it so that it's um from the perspective of the universal way open to everybody, but um, the way the text is written is for people with empowerments. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. So, so I'll, I'll adjust when I catch myself, um, but yeah, so far, no. The one exception is Shakyamuni Buddha. Yeah. So in the Shakyamuni Buddha chapter of the Power of Mantra book, there's a practice where you actually arise as Shakyamuni Buddha specifically, and you send out Shakyamuni Buddhas everywhere. And this is the one exception where you can arise as the deity before you have the empowerment. So if you want to experiment with that mindset, Shakyamuni Buddha, Shakyamuni Buddha, Shakyamuni Buddha is the one you can do. Yeah. Um, yeah, go ahead. And it would be cool to like wish for eventually that. Totally. Yeah, totally. And with all of this, you know, have the strong aspiration, may I be able to do this? May I be able to do this? Yeah, that actually creates the cause for it to happen. Yeah. And when there's um, a llama or, a, you know, a teacher that you have a strong connection with coming to town, someone that you've had regular sutra teachings from that you've, you've kind of observed over a period of time, request the empowerment you want. Yeah, if you've been like, I like this teacher, I've liked this teacher a long time. I like Tara, I've liked Tara a long time. Request, like make it happen. Because what? how do things get onto a program at a Dharma center? Someone requests, that's how it happens. Yeah, so um, be proactive with your practice too and make sure you're asking for what you want. And keep asking, you know, if they say not this time, just keep asking. Because every time you ask, it creates the cause. Yeah, yeah, other questions and any anybody online too, you can jump in. Yeah, we have one online question. Yeah, sure. Go ahead. Yes. Hi, Vena. Thank you so much. Um, I admit, uh, I had already this question, but I know you have too many students, so I repeat it. Uh, I was fortunate enough to have a empowerment, if I can say so. It's a big word for me. Uh, with uh, online with the Dalai Lama at 20, uh, in June, and after that I did like um, uh, empowerment of genders. Uh, after that I do like morning and evening um, short chandrasic um, practice and then um, I when I I was too busy uh, I just say the short mantra every now and then during the day and morning and night I wanted to know if I 
can consider myself like an empowerment one. And yeah. uh, what can I do to bring it back? Thank you. Yeah, if you've taken an empowerment from His Holiness the Dalai Lama live online, you have the empowerment. He is your Vajra guru. You are a Buddhist. It has happened, but only if you agreed. Like if you just stumbled into the YouTube channel and were like, oh, what's happening? You know, and like, you know, you weren't like actively participating. It's not like you can be involuntarily given an empowerment, right? But if during the video, well, well, his holiness was live streaming, you thought, yes, I want this empowerment. Yes, I'm receiving this empowerment. You have. So that's wonderful. That means you have bodhisattva vows. That means you have permission to practice Chen Rezig in its full-fledged form. And it's good to do so as often as you can. And these practices are what are called Kriya Tantra, lower Tantra, which usually means there's no daily commitment. It means the emphasis is on long life, is on health, and is on developing calm abiding and special insight. And all of this is to support you for eventually taking what is called a highest yoga tantra empowerment. There are four classes of tantra. In our tradition, we do the first and the last, occasionally the middles, but usually you just jump to the highest when you're ready. So these lower tantra empowerments don't necessarily have a daily commitment, although sometimes His Holiness will have given the commitment to do the mantra a certain number of times a day. So I'm not sure which time you took the empowerment lot on, but uh, I, when he did it a couple of years ago, right before the pandemic, I think he gave the commitment of like 10 malas a day. So a thousand mantras-ish. Um, so if you let go of that continuity and you stop doing it, um, purify with Vajrasattva, start again. Yeah, just start again. And part of the thing with commitments is that we put so much heaviness on ourselves when we break the continuity. And that is not what the Buddha intended. The heaviness does not help. Just dust yourself off, start again. And depth is built through continuity. So it's like if someone said, I exercised once and it didn't work, right? You would say, yeah, well, you have to keep doing it. Yeah, the same is true of these practices. The first time there's going to be some movement, there's going to be some shifts, but it's not going to have a huge impact unless you're doing it regularly. So a retreat like this is to help you learn the ways to do it so that you can do it all by yourself without me. Yeah. And, you know, and of course, my own pace is not going to be necessarily the perfect pace for everyone. For some, it'll be too slow. For some, it'll be too fast. But at least you're learning the mechanisms of how so you can do it by yourself at your home. And so let on really just start. Don't make a whole song and dance. Just do it small and gentle, but regularly. Yeah, regularly. Don't put this pressure on yourself. I must do it for hours every day. Just like do a 10 minute version every morning. And on day when you feel like expanding it, do that. But don't make it like a chore. You know, it should be something that launches into your day with more joy and connection to compassion and wisdom and leads you along the path to enlightenment. So if it starts to feel like a chore, then we've missed a point somewhere. Okay, thank you so much. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, any other questions? And the first two practices that we've been doing, are there any prayers that you got stuck on or bits of the visualization you wanted to unpack? So far, so good. Anybody online? Nope, okay. All right, so we'll turn to the meditation on Thousand Arm Chen Rezig and look at the eight verses before we actually do the practice. <laughs> So the yellow tab is the meditation on Thousand Arm Chen Rezig. And if you turn to this practices page four, or excuse me, this practices page six, it says meditation on the eight verses of thought transformation. So for you guys online, we're just doing the Thousand Arm Chen Rezig PDF and um, page six of that PDF. <clears throat> So halfway down the page, are you guys there where it says eight verses of thought transformation? Yeah, nobody lost. Okay. So these eight verses, these are from Geshe Longri Tampa. This is um, these thought transformation teachings that are specifically Mahayana. So they're aiming for complete Buddhahood enlightenment, not quote, mere Nirvana liberation. 
which means they're fairly radical antidotes to what is called self-cherishing. Does anybody know what self-cherishing is from a Buddhist perspective? What is self-cherishing? Yeah. Me first, putting yourself first before anyone else. Yeah, Rio is saying me first before anyone else. Yeah, that's a very good way to explain it. Yes, exactly. It's the Being me first. The Being attached to the eye is certainly where it comes from, but that's more related to self grasping. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but definitely they are best friends, unfortunately. Unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so self grasping is that attachment to I, the false I, the I that seems to be inherently existent. And because of that, we have self-cherishing, which says, and that I, that pretender I, should be first, <laughs> right? So that relationship is there and is problematic, yeah. Self-cherishing is really, it's me first at the expense of others or me first with indifference to others. So it's not saying you can't look after yourself. You have to look after yourself. If you want to be a bodhisattva or a Buddha, you, only, you actually have to look after yourself better. If you're just working for your own welfare, you can eat junk food, right? You can stop exercising. You can watch TV all day. You can just stay out of trouble and not hurt anybody. Yeah, you can let your health go to crap. You can let your mental health slip. You can not be particularly useful in the world and you're not causing any trouble, right? But if you are trying to get over your self-cherishing, you have to eat well. You need a healthy body, right? You need to exercise a little bit in a way that is practical and is pacing that works for you. You need to work at, look after your mental health. You can't let the black dog get its teeth into you, right? If you've got depression stuff, get yourself some therapy. If you've got anxiety, figure out what that's about. Like for the sake of others, you must be healthy. So, so, so getting rid of self-cherishing doesn't mean getting rid of cherishing yourself, right? It sounds like a paradox, but it isn't. Because self-cherishing, the negative form, is cherishing the self that doesn't exist at all. It's cherishing the facade, the pretender, the ego, right? And that one does not need any more cherishing. It has been well-cherished. It's the one that says, I'm gonna eat crap junk food and watch Netflix till my eyes burn. I'm allowed. Yeah, right, that's it. So, and like, in what way is that helping you develop along the path to enlightenment, right? I mean, at least you're not causing any trouble, right? It's not like the worst thing on earth, but do you see what I'm saying? The difference between cherishing the self in a positive way and cherishing the self in a negative way. And it's the negative self-cherishing that we're talking about. Yeah, and this is, it's very confronting to start picking at it because this negative self-cherishing says, I'm protecting you. I'm soothing you, I'm keeping you comfortable, I'm putting you at ease, I'm your best friend. When really it's the very thing that makes us feel isolated and alone and disconnected. Yeah, but somewhat placated and pacified and slightly disassociated, okay enough, yeah. So it's, it's like, it's a beast, this self-cherishing. And so these verses, are punching holes through the negative self-cherishing, which at first feels like an attack on the self, but it's not. It's an attack on the facade. So your good kind heart is finally free to be of benefit to others. And when your good kind heart is free to be of benefit to others, you're actually a lot more happy and a lot more relaxed and a lot more connected. Does that make sense? So the first one is determined to obtain the greatest possible benefit from all sentient beings who are more precious than a wish fulfilling jewel. I shall hold them most dear at all times. So these go in order of course to subtle. So this first one is talking about this wish fulfilling jewel and you see the wish fulfilling jewel pop up in the Chenrezig iconography all over the place, right? The jewel he holds in his hand. You can sort of see in the thousand arm Chen Rezig there, the jewel there, but in the forearm Chen Rezig, he holds it as well. And this mythical with fulfilling jewel of Tibetan folk stories and Indian folk stories was this, you know, amazing thing that whatever you wished for, you would get materially. And it's just a folk story, but it's saying that sentient beings are more precious than something like that. Something that you could prey on and get whatever you wanted. Why? <laughs> 
why are sentient means more precious than this thing that could give you whatever you want? Yeah, yeah. We all have Buddha nature. We all have Buddha nature, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and why, like, why are sentient beings precious, even the like crappy ones, <laughs> right? Like even the problematic ones, maybe especially the problematic ones, why are they precious? Just like, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> because they challenge us to kind of surpass the egoistic mind. Like yeah, yeah. yeah, on a good day. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Look, the thing is, it is have, yeah, go ahead, please. They yeah. have the potential to um, develop that Buddha nature, and then they, and with that, they can benefit others. So, you know, so it's not just them, but yeah. the fact that they, they develop their mind, then they can benefit billions and trillions of other sentient beings yeah exactly exactly if they were to get enlightened they could continue the greater good work absolutely yeah also that we can plant seeds with our sentient beings we can have relationships to build right yeah exactly yeah exactly and and one of the big more confronting pieces of this is also to think is there anything any quality that i like about myself that was born from ease, comfort, no big deal? <laughs> Some. What about other qualities I value about myself? Maybe my patience or resilience or independence. Were they born from hardship? Probably, <laughs> right? And were they born from relationship with really obnoxious, difficult people? Often, <laughs> right? <laughs> Did they intend to benefit you? No, they didn't. They didn't want to help you at all, but they did, right? And it's like there's this part of us that doesn't want to give them credit for our development because they didn't want to help, but they did. Like without them, who would we be? You know, without the bullies of your childhood, without the traumas of your adolescence, without the hardships of your career path, without the difficulties in your family, who would you be? You'd be kind of soft and squishy and not particularly resilient. And then tiny things would get to you, yeah? But like, if you've gone through some stuff and you have a minor inconvenience, you're like, yeah, whatever. Like it just rolls off, whatever, right? But if your life has been nothing but easy and you have a minor inconvenience, you're like enraged, you know? Cause your capacity isn't as much. So when we're thinking about how sentient beings are precious, we're thinking about the fact that the kind ones showed us how to be loving, how to be compassionate, showed us how to be in the world, modeled the behaviors that we value. And the hard ones showed us how not to be <laughs> and showed us how strong we can be. And of course, no one is good or bad in and of themselves, 100% any percentage, right? Like there's not like 100% good person and 100% bad person, nothing in the world is that tidy. Right, the kindest ones also might have been the hardest ones. See your family for details, right? <laughs> but when you're thinking of them as precious, it changes the whole way you approach your relationships. And this ties into the compassion, chen rezig attitude, which is built on so much deep respect. Yeah, you're respecting that everything in your path, everything in your spiritual path is born through interaction. If you were all alone in a cave, having never had human interactions, what would you know about life? Yeah, what would be invited in your introspection? So thinking of them as precious is not the same thing as letting them get away with bad behavior. Thinking of them as precious means your default position with sentient beings is that of appreciation and respect. Yeah, and then how do people respond to you when you meet them with appreciation and respect right off the bat? Usually it goes well. Even if it doesn't, you're a lot more relaxed. So this first level of the mental attitude, the first benefit is to you because you're at ease. You don't think I have to wait to be relaxed until I'm with people I like and know. Yeah, there's no like waiting to be relaxed. You know, when you have a stressful day at work and you're like waiting to be relaxed when you get home, 
hanging out for the relaxed time. It's like, actually, if you're feeling like you're with everything you need in order to develop on your path and your path is the most important thing in your life, you're like, oh, good, everything's here, right? Uh, it's easier said than done, but it's an interesting thought experiment. So this is what we're touching on. And this is where you're thinking, I'm actually getting benefit from sentient beings. And this is Lama Zoparimshe's translation. This verse doesn't always say from, but he's particularly translated that line as from all sentient beings to help us start with the attitude of actually we need everybody. We cannot do this alone. It's a solitary internal personal path that is deeply reliant on interconnection. Does that make sense? Um, and then the second one, which is one of the like tricky problematic ones that needs uh, immediate context or else you go the wrong way or you think Buddhism's crazy is when in the company of others, I shall always consider myself the lowest of all. And from the depths of my heart, hold, hold others dear and supreme. And you're like, well, that seems like a terrible idea. That sounds like my martyred grandma, right? Who's like, no, 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 for you, for you. I'm fine, I'm fine, right? Or it sounds like a doormat or it sounds like total complacency. Like you're just letting people get away with murder. And again, this is a mental attitude, not an external behavior. And in Buddhism, there are so many things like this that are secret, private, internal conversations. But then externally, you're just a regular person living your life, not being weird. Right. So externally, you're not like, oh, no, no, I'm the lowest of all. No, that don't get weird. All right. It's internally you're thinking the servant leader mentality. Yeah. Did you ever see like Downton Abbey or like Bride's Head Revisited or like one of those English miniseries where um, they have very dignified butlers? Right. And the butler is like the one who's the best dressed all the time, best dressed. Yeah. And then all of the people he's serving, you know, are getting up to all sorts of dramas and hijinks and whatever. But the butler remains dignified in the service position. He's not lowly. Right. The butler is not lowly. They're in a dignified service position of great strength and leadership and putting others before themselves. Now, that's a profession and what's really going on in their minds, who knows, and what mischief they get up to after hours is another story. But what we're talking about is this mental attitude that is service, but not oppressed. Do you feel the difference, right? And when you're in that kind of like service mentality, maybe it's happened when you've been the host of something, or you've had to organize a big conference or organize a big something, and you genuinely want everyone to have a good time but you don't have tons of tightness and expectation about it because you know people are rebellious and they're going to do what they want, but you really do want them to have a good time. So you're spacious, right? You're spacious, you don't have expectations, but you're in that service thing. And you might think, oh, so-and-so loves it when I make sure that there's lots of light and somewhere comfy to sit. And so this other person loves it if there's somewhere they can kind of go be alone. And that group of people is going to want a little cluster of five chairs where they can all be together and talk together. And you're really thinking what's going to make this party great or this event wonderful. And it kind of delights you to think, how can I help people? And it may or may not work, but you kind of, you're like, well, this is the best of what I have to offer. And then you let go. So you're like the lowest of all because you're the strongest of all because you've decided to be bigger than their drama. You've decided to be bigger than their moods. Do you know when you've been in those points in your life where you've decided you're not going to get swept up in other people's madness? Yeah, like it's a, it's a really wholesome state of mind, but it's also a very empowered, relaxed state of mind. Sometimes it happens when you're with your pets, right? Or with like children, not your own children, usually it doesn't work, but like other people's children, right? <laughs> Where you're like, all right, this is what we're gonna do. We're gonna have fun. You can either have fun or not, but we're gonna have fun. And you make a plan for them, but you also like, you know how kids are, so you don't have too much pressure and expectations. Can you find some sort of example in your life where you've been in that mindset state of the lowest of all, but not oppressed? Yeah. So that mentality of the lowest of all also makes you immediately the listener, not the talker, right? 
or if you're the talker, it's to elicit wisdom from others. And it kind of takes you out of a competitive mindset, which immediately makes people feel safe and at ease. Yeah. And I mean, I think that like, particularly women are socialized to be this almost at the expense of collaboration and leadership roles. And that's an unfortunate way that we've been socialized. If you were assigned female at birth and brought up in that way, then maybe we do this too much. But nevertheless, there's a mentality there, which is actually very empowered. Can you feel the difference between like forcibly being the lowest of all and choosing to be the lowest of all? And if you're choosing to be the lowest of all, you're not going to be the problem in a staff meeting, right? You're going to be the one that opens up the space and is listening deeply for where there is wisdom, where there is connection, and you immediately start to facilitate and connect people together and uplift the good ideas and gently take energy away from the bad ideas and notice where people are saying the same thing and link them up together and all of that beautiful stuff that can happen when people come together with less ego. And when you're in this state, you can sometimes then set the tone and other people will start doing it too. Yeah. So if you read this, think out of competition, not I've lost the competition, not I've decided to be the loser, not that, but I've decided I'm not even gonna play the game. So then the third one is easier. The third one is more straightforward. It's just vigilant. The moment a delusion appears in my mind, endangering myself and others, I shall confront and avert it without delay, which is just that type of mindfulness that is watching for when you stray off of your core values. So whether you're Buddhist or not, you know, if you want to just kind of articulate to yourself, what is my core value? Like, it is, a, is it one word like compassion? Is it one word like integrity or peace? But, you know, kind of what is your core value? And it's each, you know, an individual thing. It might be my core value is bodhicitta if you're Buddhist. But you just kind of sit with, okay, what do I want to be the dominant energy internally? And what do I want the dominant energy to be when I am with other people? Like, what do I want to express in this world? And say it's something like peace or integrity or whatever it is, this vigilance is just checking, have I strayed? And because we go against our best intentions all the time. So it's not, whoops, you're bad. It's just, whoops. Yeah, no value judgment. Just, oh, I slipped. Just like you would if you're walking along the path here and you were kind of distracted and you stumbled for a second. You don't stop and think, oh, I'm so stupid for stumbling. I'm so bad. What a stupid person who would roll their foot along a rock. Oh my gosh. You wouldn't do a whole stupid story about stumbling on a rock. You'd just be like, oh, whoops, pay attention. And like on with it. So that's the attitude, right? It's not a punishing, punitive, heavy attitude. It's just a gentle correcting which means that initially you need to have decided what's most important to you. Because what are you going to correct yourself to if you haven't articulated it for yourself? Questions about those three or bits you wanted to add? I have a question about a word that I heard. I don't know if I know it very well. I did understand it very well. Would you please, Venerable, explain about uh, spiritual bypassing? Spiritual uh, bypassing? Mm -hmm. Yeah, spiritual bypassing is a good word to know. <laughs> um, do you guys know about spiritual bypassing? Is this a word you come across? Um, it's no doubt an experience you've had, whether or not you had a word for it or not. And it can happen with anything, not just Buddhism, right? It's basically, you have a good idea or a good system, right? You have a good way of thinking, whether it's psychology or Buddhism or Hinduism or whatever it is, you have a good set of ideas. And then you think, I want to live that way. And you start living your life and you notice you don't live that way, but you should, because you've put all this should pressure on yourself. So you jump to this high, high ideal, skipping all the steps in between. And so you're bypassing your real lived experience of this moment to launch yourself into the ideal. 
right? So it's it, the most common one is with karma, right? So you start learning about karma, cause and effect, negative, negative actions lead to suffering, positive actions lead to happiness. And then like something happens to you, like you got hit by a car and you, you know, barely made it out alive and you think, oh man, that was hard. Well, it was just my karma. It was just my karma. It's fine. It's fine. It was just my karma. When really it's like, well, go to the hospital, like get checked out, like have some soup. Are you okay? Your nervous system's all jangly. Do something practical. That was scary. Yeah. But the spiritual bypass goes straight to, oh, it's just my karma. It's just my karma. Right. Mm -hmm. Or like, you know, someone is diagnosed with cancer and you say to them, oh, it's just your karma. Like not helpful, right? Not the time to say that. Not at all helpful. So it's the spiritual bypass. It's like there's some high ideal of radical reframing. And rather than walk through all the very crucial steps to get there, you just skip to the end. Yeah, you skip to the end. And in skipping to the end, then we're going to mix in my, um, you know, friendship with psychology and do what is called an empathic failure. <laughs> right? Either. So you'll say to someone, oh, it's just your karma. You've missed out on the fact that they're in front of you suffering. And that was actually the most important part of this moment was they're in front of you suffering. Talk about that. Yeah. Don't jump to the end. It's not useful in that moment. Do you know what I mean? So you can do that with anything, right? It doesn't matter if it's Buddhism or whatever. You have the ideal and there are many steps to get to the ideal. And because you intellectually know where you're going, you've decided you're already there. Yeah, it's almost like when people say, oh yeah, I know how meditation works. So I know how it work were I to do it. Therefore, it's as good as actually having done it, <laughs> right? Like we do this, don't we? Like, you know, so it doesn't work for me. I've never actually tried it, but I know how it would work were I to do it. And it's not for me. That's also spiritual bypassing. Is this so, uh, so yeah, go ahead. Is it um, a spiritual bypassing when oh, you are sick, even if it's a cancer or something, and you do low jump up all over it? <laughs> but, well, you it low jump, but it's just about the timing, Ladan. It's the timing, right? So you always have to meet yourself or meet the other person where you actually are in this moment, not where you assume you should be. Right. So you meet yourself where you are in this moment. And your first step is either compassion for yourself or compassion for them or compassion for both of you. And then stabilizing that, you ask, do I have the mental space to elevate my thinking? Some days you do and some days you don't. And just because yesterday you were able to go into this amazing transformative place doesn't mean today you can. Yeah, you might not have slept as well. You might not have eaten as well. You might not have the same energy or human supports around you. So it, it takes a lot of discipline to meet yourself where you are in this moment, uh -huh. right? And not always make plans based on how you are at your best. Because otherwise, then you're constantly disappointing yourself or you're skipping steps that are needed in this moment. And it also means you might not see the people right in front of you and what they need in this moment. Because you know they're a strong person, but are they a strong person in this exact second in front of you? Like, look, check, see if that's true. So Lojong or thought transformation is a very amazing way to think, but only if you're really doing it in a genuine way specific to the moment. Is so it the same thing that uh, when you say, everybody say, when Buddha says it's the um, present moment, leave it like in present moment if you are suffering just accept is it well, the same thing that you don't bypass the moment and you go further to be the better self uh, or i don't know a better person of yourself better version of yourself you just here and now and you're suffering you know that you're suffering right well I mean, I feel like you're somehow both oversimplifying and overcomplicating. <laughs> but um, I know that you're going in the right direction. You're going the right okay. direction, right? So I guess I worry when you say things like just accept it because my training is not complacency, 
right? It's not complacency saying, oh, this is just my fate. Oh, it's just my karma. Okay, <laughs> peace with it. It's not that, right? It's saying, oh, this is what's happening. What do I have the space to do with it? Yeah. What, what mental space do I have to use what's happening right now as fuel for my practice? Yeah, it's just a very deep self-awareness meeting what you've intellectually understood. Yeah, so the, the spiritual bypass is thinking the intellectual understanding it is enough and going straight there, bypassing the actual experience. Yeah. So just gently, gently sit with this, but, but really it's about self-awareness meeting your intelligence and what you've learned. Yeah. And just common sense. Yeah. Yeah. Just common sense gently. <laughs> yeah. Anything else? Okay. So four, then we're getting um, more into the heavy duties and the more easily misunderstood. <clears throat> Verse four is whenever I see beings who are wicked in nature and overwhelmed by violent negative actions and suffering, I shall hold such rare ones dear as if I had found a precious treasure. So there's a lot to unpack there. The first line is what is a being who is wicked in nature? And that is, um, it's a challenging turn of phrase. And it's not to say that there is actually anyone who is wicked by nature. There isn't. What we're saying is people who are so strongly habituated to negativity and harmfulness that that is their immediate response to most things. So this might be someone who in psychology terms, you might call you know, a psychopath or someone with you know, some kind of personality disorder combined with trauma or brain injury or whatever in that perfect storm of situations that has meant that whenever they see an opportunity to take someone for granted, they do. Whenever they see an opportunity to manipulate, they do. Um, you know, there may have been political figures in our past that might represent this for us, for example, not naming names, but, you know, there, there's any number and, you know, particularly politicians of all sides, you know, people that are very much about self-interest first, right, or for us first, right, this kind of habituation is happily not that common, like all of us are self-centered, right? All of us have self-cherishing. That's unfortunate, but we're also nice people and we try to not be so selfish. Yes, most people are trying to not be so selfish. And then there are those rare ones who really are awful, right? And those ones are a precious treasure. Why? <laughs> why those, those rare cases of people strongly habituated to negativity, why are they so precious? Because we learn from them. They're, they're the best teachers. Yeah, exactly. Best teacher. Involuntarily the best, best teacher. <laughs> they didn't mean to be the best teacher, but they were. Yeah. And again, you don't want to give them credit because they hurt you, but they were really important in your path. Yeah. And whether there's someone you've actually met in your everyday life, or there's someone in the world who is doing great harm, thinking about those kind of people can really open up your understanding of the human experience. And, as, and particularly if you can put yourself in their shoes and be like, how would someone wind up that way? Right? Because we all have the same type of consciousness and we all have Buddha nature and we all have innate ignorance. And then a gazillion experiences have happened and nudged us different ways. And yes, there is free will, but that free will is dependently arisen. So it's free will in quotes. If we had had the exact same series of lifetimes and experiences as this difficult person, we would have wound up the same. And part of us thinks that's impossible. I would never wind up that way. And that is a great fault and a lack of self-awareness on our part. And it also blocks compassion. Now, strangely, sometimes we can find that we're very compassionate towards, you know, some random serial killer, like after we watched a documentary about them and we went, but, oh yeah, he did terrible things, but look at his childhood, right? Oh, poor guy. Oh my gosh. Oh, and the brain injury. Oh, and the genetic thing. Oh yeah, of course he wound up that way. Poor serial killer. But then like our next door neighbor, who's a generally nice person, but like uses a leaf blower, we cannot stand 
we're like, oh my God, they use a leaf blower. <laughs> right. Like a regular nice person wouldn't hurt a fly, but uses a leaf blower. We can't stand them. Serial killer will let off the hook. So sometimes the, the ones that cause us friction are the ones that are a little close to home because they're similar to us. The ones that are very, very far away, like you'd never be a serial killer in this life. You can somehow have the space to explore how they might've gotten that way and come to some sort of compassion for them. Yeah, because it's like enough removed. It's not so confronting. This can happen too. But look, you know, at, on the surface, it just looks like, you know, see everyone as your teacher, use everything as a lesson. It can sound really cliche, right? It can sound trite. It can sound like things that you've known your whole life before you met Buddhism. And you think, yeah, that's well and good. But if you knew my mother-in-law, right? <laughs> you know, and but the thing is, make it personal, make it real and ask yourself what the benefit would be. What would the benefit be to adopting this kind of attitude? First for yourself, right? As soon as you meet someone and you think you are a problem, what happens to your body? What happens to your mind? You tighten up or you disappear or you get aggressive, right? Your mind kind of goes into some disassociative, cloudy, woo-woo state to try and escape the intensity of being around them. Or it sort of tries to like sugarcoat everything and make it okay when it's really not. Or it gets really aggressive and thinks of how can I challenge them? Any number of things happen, but they're not comfortable. If you're like, I'm gonna meet someone who's a problem, you've already made a problem, right? And they might've actually been in a good mood that day. They might've actually been in a good place that day, not gonna cause any trouble, but you're meeting them expecting a trouble, trouble comes. So if you're thinking this person is actually a precious treasure, you know, God bless them, <laughs> right? They're a precious treasure. Actually something really interesting happens first physically, then mentally where you relax into some kind of curiosity of how can I use the difficulties of this moment in a really deep transformative way. And that doesn't mean you suddenly let them off the hook for bad behavior. Again, it's like a secret, private, internal conversation that puts you at ease, that connects you with altruism and wisdom. And then what you say is not going to be from your agitated space, right? When our mind is agitated, we just default to our most habitual responses, which are sometimes not skillful. Sometimes they work okay and they've held us in good stead, but like what we want is the whole spectrum of our life experience to be available to us, right? We want everything we've learned in life to be accessible. And for that to be so, you need a relaxed mind. Yeah, there's a lot of possibilities and creativity in a relaxed mind. A stressed mind, there's only a couple possibilities. So the first benefit is to you. And then the benefit is to everybody around you because you've not added fuel to the fire. Thoughts about this one or doubts, issues? Is it resonating? Does it make sense how it ties into Chenrezig practice, wisdom and compassion being united? Yeah. I mean, you know, intellectually, it's not brain surgery, right? But just kind of experientially, like, how does that land? You know, you got to kind of hunt around in your life and like, who is the wicked one? Maybe there aren't any, maybe there used to be, maybe there has to be someone, you know, in the news that I see that triggers that. But like, who is the person where compassion is not flowing easily, where I am not relaxed? You know, who is that one, that rare, precious treasure? You know, and, you know, of course, in Dharma communities, that becomes a nice passive aggressive insult. We're like, oh, yeah, precious treasure. And you're like, hey, <laughs> you know, right? you're my teacher of patience. <laughs> right. <laughs> you're showing me my mind. Right. Right. Yeah, go ahead. So is it beneficial when you're doing uh, visualization, like you were doing, you know, having the lotus and <clears throat> raising on? all these sentient beings to kind of visualize putting it on like Hitler's head or Osama bin Laden's head. Does that? Yeah, definitely. You know, just because, you know, I always visualize this nice kind of humble looking. Yeah, right. Or, you know, yeah. skinny little, you know, starving people. That 
that's very helpful. Yeah, and, right. To support them. Start putting it on people who are not friendly or, you know, dictators. Or yeah. Yeah. All sentient beings means all sentient beings, including you, right? Like you get one too. You get a Chen yeah. Rezig. <laughs> you get a Chen Rezig. You get a Chen Rezig, right? Like Oprah, right? <laughs> Everybody gets a Chen Rezig, right? But it's it's one of these things where we we need to notice like where it goes very easily and freely, like vulnerable people. You want them to have the support of Chen Rezig or people in your life. And then you're kind of like, yeah, but none for you though, you know, dictators of the world. But who are they are the ones that need it the most, right? They are the ones that need it more than anyone. If they got compassion and wisdom, all the vulnerable people would be in less of a state, you know, and Really, it's it's an interesting thing to kind of look at how much we associate people with behaviors when behaviors are just the surface. Yeah, we have to address behaviors. We don't need to ignore behaviors, but don't identify people as what they're up to, right? That's just more of a facade. Yeah, because I you noticed, know? like, you know, I would put this um, Chen Rezig and the Lotus on bugs and slugs, but yeah. not people with you know, for bad. Yeah. You know, it just seems those are easy. Yeah. It's, yeah. Yeah, it makes sense. It makes sense. But yeah, everybody needs everybody. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, you know, with all of these things, never force it. You know, with all of these things, don't talk over the top of your own resistance and doubts. Like that would be spiritual bypassing, right? Like notice when you have resistance and doubts, you know, and like hold the question and keep coming back to the question, because this is, you know, an investigative religion, right? This is a debate encouraging religion, and it's really deeply personal. So if you haven't made it personal, it's not going to work. You know, you think, here's how I should think, but I don't think, but I'll pretend I already do think, you get glassy eyed, mm -hmm. and you get fundamentalist, and it doesn't work. Yeah. So what's your problem with that? Uh, my faith, yeah, but that's different than holding the question, right? But exactly, I mean, that it's wrong would be that without versus holding a question of like, oh, is it really, yeah, yeah. And I mean, in Buddhism, there's even you know lists for different kinds of doubt because we love a list, right? We love a list, so there's like doubt tending towards and doubt that is even and doubt that is going against, and you know, at, at the end of the day, the doubt that is even doubt of maybe, maybe not, nothing wrong with maybe, maybe not. And doubt that is like, that's probably true, but I'm not sure how, or that's probably true, but I need more details. You know, it's moving you in the right direction. And the doubt that says that's absolutely impossible. You can have that doubt too. It's your life, right? Like, but, you know, ask the question, like, make sure you've like looked at all the edges of it and you're not just flicking it because it's hard or because it's confusing, you know? So all forms of doubt can be really useful for wisdom and you don't have to push any of them away. Um, it helps to, at some point, tell your doubt to rest a sec and I'll come back to you when I have more information. So like nursing a constant doubt will inhibit progress, you know? So it's like, okay, I've kind of gotten as much information about this particular question as I have room to process. I haven't resolved it, I'm coming back to it, but I'm not gonna keep picking the scab right now because I don't have enough new resources to bring to it. You know, so it's also that kind of wisdom of some of these things I'm gonna need to put in the, I'll check later. And even make a list of them, you know, cause there are, you know, big amazing llamas that come to all of the Dharma centers that you can kind of be like, here are the big questions. <laughs> Ta-da, I've made a list for you. <laughs> yeah, and they're like, oh good, we got a live one, you know? So yeah, I like that doubt. Um, so five is when out of envy, others mistreat me with abuse, insults or the like. I shall accept defeat and offer the victory to others. So this is another one of like getting out of the game, getting out of competition, right? And first of all, when others mistreat me, how often is it out of envy, out of jealousy? That's not a word that we think about as much as adults. Like we look at our desirous attachment, we look at our anger, but we're not as much like investigating the nature of jealousy and pride and things, particularly because in Western society and well, all not just Western, Eastern society, ambition is kind of held up as something good, 
yeah, and competitiveness and, you know, kind of like, why do they have that? I should get that harumph, you know, kind of mentality is so normal. We don't usually take a minute and say, actually, jealousy is quite problematic, right? We don't usually give that a lot of airtime. So when others are mistreating me, our first thought is usually, depending on our socialization, am I bad? What did I do? Or what's wrong with you? You misunderstood me. Right. It's usually bad, right? Either I'm bad or they're bad. Not, oh, they're struggling. They're jealous of me. How could they be jealous of me? I don't have anything. I'm nothing special. Why would they be jealous of me? But when people mistreat you, a lot of the time it's out of envy. And we don't even realize it. What could they possibly be envious of? They might be envious of your peace of mind, right? They might be envious of your level of relaxation and ease in the world. They might be jealous of very obvious basic things like your material wealth or your healthy marriage or your cute dog or who knows, right? Or your like financial status, I don't know. There's a lot of things people might be envious of that you take for granted and would never occur to you are any big deal. But when people are mistreating you, it is interesting to ask, what is the deprivation they're feeling? Because immediately it softens you and you don't have that defensive reactivity. You think, what are they feeling deprived of in this moment? Yeah. How do you listen to the street? Well, that's a good question. How do you know if somebody's mistreating you? Because we can't really know people's intentions, right? But we can make an educated guess. <laughs> We can make an educated guess. If their words seem to be wanting to wound, right? Do you so deserve wounding words? No. Is it based on how you feel? Ultimately? I mean, whether you feel mistreated and or they mean mistreatment, it is very much, as you say, about you. If you feel mistreated, whether they intended to or not, that's the first place to kind of examine for sure is like, did I set up a target to feel the wound? You know, I mean, I have, I have friends who like everything rolls off them. You could, you could call them any kind of insult and they would just laugh. There's no target. Yeah. You know, and yeah, gee, you know, like that's where I have envy. I'm like, that's impressive. I would like to be that easygoing. Nothing hits them. So whether people intend to mistreat them or not, it doesn't affect them. The question is, is it healthy to let people be badly behaved for them? Like, of course, for you, right? Like you can um, be worn down by people really s squashing you, right? You can really get worn down by that, by people picking at you and being critical of you and being unkind and disrespectful. That can really wear you down. Yeah. So of course, it's your responsibility, how you feel about things and how you respond to things. But that doesn't mean you should accept bad behavior, do you know what I mean? So I think just using your, you know, good, solid, common sense of actually, objectively, if that person said that to my best friend, I would defend my best friend. You know, you have to be a friend to yourself and be like, is that an acceptable way for other people to treat me? You know, stand up for yourself, not because you need to win, right? It's again, it's not about winning. It's about, it's not good for them to keep behaving badly. Yeah. And how many people in their life have they alienated and harmed and not even realized it because they get away with it? You know, like it takes a huge act of bravery to confront someone, but how much more so if you were to confront someone while offering the victory? So internally, your mentality is, I don't need to win this argument, but externally, because I care about you, I'm going to be brave enough to have a hard conversation or to tell you that I'm leaving because you're not listening to the conversation. Yeah. So it's, it's this tricky thing where you're taking these high ideals and then you're taking what's really going on for you in your life and asking what's practical. Yeah. And like, where do they marry up? Because some of these ways of being, it's too soon for us to go into the fully fledged form, but we can live in aspiration and think I would like to live this way eventually but not quite yet. It's a little too soon, especially with said chaos in my life or with this particular relationship. You know, so it's really just, you know, this is an interesting way to live. I would like to live that way someday. And in some contexts, I already can, you know? 
And, you know, it could be something simple like what victories can I offer that don't feel like they're costing me some sort of integrity or costing me some sort of, I don't know, anything except for loss of the ego, you know, basic things, you know, little arguments, little quibbles between friends, little moments in traffic, right? Like, well, I was here first at the stop sign, but you can go first. I can tell you need it, <laughs> right? Minor victories you offer. You're like, it's fine, just go, <laughs> right? It'll make traffic better for everyone if you're less stressed. Random Dodge pickup truck, <laughs> for example, I'm from Montana. Um, <laughs> black Dodge Ram. <laughs> fine <laughs> right but occasionally you want to be like no i got here first it's you've gotten away with enough young man <laughs> is it always a young man yes no i'm kidding, <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> but you know so it's one of these things where these should make you playful and curious and creative about how different ways of thinking can affect your immediate well-being and then how effective you are with others because if you're unflappable you're going to be more happy. And if you're unflappable, people are going to get the best of you, you know? So, you know, it might be that one of these really resonates and the others not so much. Um, when we're doing the practice, the light is kind of helping you to understand and integrate is the way to think of it. So Chenrezig is at your crown, sending down light respective to these verses one by one, helping you understand and integrate the deepest meaning of them. And so then number six is when someone whom I have benefited and in whom I have great hopes gives me terrible harm, I shall regard that person as my holy guru. So this is about betrayal. Yeah. Who is the really, really precious, the really, really, really precious? Someone you gave a lot of time, a lot of energy, a lot of care, a lot of love, a lot of support to, who then turned around and bit you in Nebet. Yeah. That is a gem. And again, it doesn't mean you need to accept the behavior. It's about what your internal process is about how conditional was my love. Part of me thought if I did all these nice things for you, that would equal friendly behavior from you. If I'm nice to you, you'll be nice to me. And then you realize, oh, I've just made love a business transaction. Embarrassing, not the spiritual path understandable, human, very common, but not the deepest way. So the one that you've benefited, not being appreciative, super helpful, right? Because you think, wow, wow, I really was doing all these kind things with the background assumption they'd be appreciative or they'd respond or they'd like me. And that actually made all of the kindness all about me and my needs and not actually so altruistic as I thought. Like that's epic, that one, yeah? Like managing betrayal with some kind of grace. It's so hard, right? And if you think like, okay, who's someone that in my life I've given so much love and care to? You know, nieces and nephews or siblings or children, particularly this can be triggering or spouses, yeah? Best friends, whatever. You've done so much for them and they are not appreciative, they don't care, and they might even turn around and betray you. That is unacceptable behavior from them and very useful for you. Yeah, because we don't want love to be a business deal. Yeah, which is not to say you don't negotiate things in relationships about, hey, I'm carrying more of the load in this area, can we balance it? So, so do you see this weird paradox about how internally you become like this selfless, selfless in the sense of altruistic and without selfishness, the selfless being, this bodhisattva, aspiring bodhisattva person, but then your behavior is more brave, more assertive. Yeah, but with less expectations, less pressure, less tension. Because it also is kind of like, now you've taken the sting out of your worst case scenario. Yeah, you've taken the sting out because you've already made peace with the difficult things happening. So now you can be brave and assertive. And if it doesn't work, you're not thrown by that. You're not trapped by your own expectations anymore. And you're like, what would happen if I just said, hey, could you sometimes also do the dishes? How about we take turns? <laughs> right? Like if it's a fight or if it's not a fight, you're not so scared now because it's like, 
let's see. But before you were scared of the fight. Yeah, before you were like, if I actually say the thing that is fair, they might take their love from me, right? And it's like, well, if that's what it was based on, it wasn't really love. You're well shut of them. Bless them, wish them well. Yeah, bygones, right? Shake your hand, off you go. So a lot of this is an antidote to like codependency. Yeah. And a lot of our love is actually just codependent attachment. Please love me. Please like me. Please tell me I'm good. I'll do whatever you want. Just don't leave me. Oh God, right? Like human, but not love. Yeah. And we might bend over backwards being a healthy helper and a fixer and a solver because we just want to be seen and loved. Yeah. And that doesn't mean you shouldn't be seen and loved, right? You should be seen, you should be loved, but not as payment. Yeah, just because you're a human, you deserve it. That's the reason. You don't have to do anything to deserve that. You already deserve it. Do you know what I mean? So these are very empowering things. And when you read these, you realize this is advanced Buddhism, even though it's intellectually easy, it's advanced emotional work. And so if you're not there yet, don't force it, but just kind of experiment with how you might be able to weave these into your life. And then when you get into number seven, it's, it seems to be gentling, but it's actually even more challenging. It says in short, both directly and indirectly, do I offer every happiness and benefit to all my mothers? I shall secretly take upon myself all their harmful actions and suffering. So this is related to the Tonglen practice of giving and taking, which we'll talk about a little bit later. But what it's saying, this key word here is secretly, right? So without expecting applause, without expecting recognition, without anyone knowing it was you, do what you can to offer people support. And without kind of holding a grudge or vengeance or storing ammunition, see what you can to take people's suffering and bad behavior hold people's secrets unless it's damaging to the community or family. You know, like if someone has got epic debt and they're in financial crisis and they've told you their best friend about how much debt they're in and they're so scared about it and they just needed someone to say, oh, that sounds really scary and hard. Do you want me to help you find a financial planner? Do you need a loan? Whatever. And then you go around and you tell everyone, guess who's in debt? Guess all their like, you know, financial baggage. That's not secretly taking on their suffering, right? But sometimes like we'll have, someone will offer us this precious thing of confiding their suffering in us. And they've, you know, really trusted us. And then we're like, oh, I have got a meaty piece of gossip. Who can I tell? Yeah. And you might, under, it might even share it with the idea of, oh, I just need to vent now that I've heard this big thing. I need to just vent. I'm not gossiping, I'm venting, right? I'll just tell my best friend. I'll just tell my spouse. And then they'll tell their best friend and their best friend and their best friend, right? So taking on in this secretly way, this is again, not getting into some kind of like toxic, like Catholic church weirdness or anything, like don't go that route, okay? The secretly is about not expecting applause and about respecting people's privacy. And, you know, it's sort of, it can play out in community, right? If someone's having a stressful time and they don't do a couple of jobs they were supposed to do, and you notice and you have the space to just do it for them, just do it for them anonymously, not expecting applause, not punishing them for it later, not saying, look, it was me, I'm a good person. You know, this is deep work, right? Just do it for them. And if it's a pattern and if it's a problem, you tell them about it, right? Like keep your common sense. But the internal processes is how can I offer people happiness and how can I minimize their suffering without needing to be the star of the show or the hero or the victim? or the one with the spotlight on me. That's what the secret Lee is referring to. Does that, does that make sense, the mentality? And you could see how you could go the wrong way with it, right? If you took it the wrong way, it could be disaster. But the right way, really empowering. And again, it's that weird double-edged sword of just because you're deciding to not need validation 
doesn't mean you don't deserve validation, right? Just because you've decided I'm not going to chase the spotlight, just because I've decided I'm not going to need people to give me feedback all the time, doesn't mean that when you see people doing good stuff, you don't give them feedback and validation. Do it even more. Do it as a gift, right? So internally, you're like trying to like separate yourself from that kind of clinging attachment, ego-driven need to be seen, while at the same time realizing people really want to be seen. I'm going to see them. Yeah, and show them I see the best in them. Yeah. D are you with me? Yeah, go ahead. Then, like us doing that, recognizing other people automatically will come back to us and we have to kind of like accept it gracefully without taking it into our head. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, it's it's delicate, right? Like it, it, Rio was saying, basically, if you start doing that, then people are going to be nicer to you, and then it could make you have a big head, right? <laughs> right. And you have to just kind of navigate it skillfully and realize that what people say to you usually has a lot more to do with them than you, even if it's about you. Yeah, criticism and praise. And I mean, I don't know about you guys, but if people say to you, you're so amazing, the first response is usually, oh God, <laughs> right? No, I'm not, <laughs> right? Or if they say you're so awful, you go, I know, I know, I am, I am, right? We choose to identify with certain types of feedback and not others. That's about us, right? We, I mean, have you had this, right? This is again, like socialization for the most part, but like, especially if you have some sort of like Northern European socialization, like it's like inviting the evil eye to be praised. Right? I don't know if other cultures have that too, probably. People are very, very nice to you. You're like, oh God, <laughs> right? But you know, part of you is like, thanks for noticing. Stop noticing. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but like, we need to really look at what, what is landing and why. And also looking at why are they saying that and why? Sometimes people are validating you because they love you, they appreciate you, and they want to support what you're doing. Sometimes they validate you because they want something. <laughs> right? Right? So, you know, it's like always grain of salt, isn't it? Yeah. Dependent arising, dependent arising. Yeah, and so this Tonglin practice, um, the taking on suffering and giving happiness, we'll do that in the next session a little bit. But the last one is pointing to ultimate truth, and that's probably the more kind of confusing um, side of things that we'll go into with the Manjushri a lot as well, which is undefiled by the stains of the superstitions of the eight worldly concerns. May I, by perceiving all phenomena as illusory, be released from the bondage of attachment. Okay. So the stains of the superstitions, right? The stains of the superstitions. There's a lot of different kinds of superstitions. It's not like a black cat walks in front of you and you're going to have bad luck and don't go under ladders. We're talking about the superstitions that are just kind of built into the way we project all the time. And so the superstitions of the eight worldly concerns is basically our habit of push and pull. Yeah, the way things feel like too much or not enough all the time. Yeah, I want more of this, less of that, more of this, less of that. So this eight worldly concerns, it's basically assuming that happiness comes from pleasure and comfort and that suffering comes from discomfort and pain. That being the assumption when that's more just the trend. Yeah. And so if you are assuming that everything that is pleasant and comfortable is good, that's a trap, that's a superstition. So then you're chasing it all the time. The example I like to give about that is, take for example, being comfort focused when you're in an outdoor cafe. Okay, you're in an outdoor cafe and you're comfort focused. The chair isn't quite right. The table is doing the wobbly thing. Shall I fold up a napkin and put it under one of the legs? Will I be seen as kind of a weirdo? You're having those kind of internal conversations. Yeah, shall I fix it? What should I do? What should I do? And you're really thinking, oh, it's a little cold, but it's not that cold. Do I need to go to my car and get my, get my jacket? I don't know, uh, comfort fixation. And really what's happening is you're just mildly uncomfortable. It's not that big a deal. But because you're in comfort fixation, your mind keeps hunting for problems and is getting itself all stirred up. And then your friend comes 
And you're like, oh, my friend. They sit down, you start talking, and you have such a good conversation. You forget about the wobbly table. You forget that you're just slightly cold, and you have a great time. So it shows that comfort was not the main thing, but it became the main thing when you gave it all the power. Does that example make sense, right? So all of the eight worldly concerns are like that, where there's a baseline kind of a common sense thing of, yeah, comfort's nice, discomfort's not nice. But if you give it too much power, it becomes too important. Yeah, and then you have the same ideas about gain and loss and about criticism and validation and about reputation, good or bad. So they're pairs, the eight worldly concerns of I need this in order to be happy, or if I have this, I can't be happy, and their superstitions. So undefiled by the stains of them means unhooking yourself from the habits of them. So may I, by perceiving all phenomena as illusory, be released from the bondage of attachment. So seeing all phenomena as illusory doesn't mean thinking that things don't exist. It means acknowledging that the way they seem is not the way they are. Yeah, the way they seem is that they're inherently existent. How they are is empty of inherent existence. Yeah, and we cannot see their lack of inherent existence yet at our level, but we can break the spell by remembering that's the case. Yeah, so more about emptiness with Manjushri tomorrow, but these are the eight verses of thought transformation.